Well, good evening. I want to welcome you uh, this evening to Weiss Memorial Baptist Church, and we thank you so much for tuning in online, whether you have gone to the link on Facebook and eventually found your way to YouTube or you went straight there. We're so grateful that you join us, so let's go ahead and get Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this day that you have created. Uh, Lord, this day uh, we have in place a new president. And Heavenly Father, we pray, God, that uh, the transition uh, for everything that needs to take place over the next few days, God, would be smooth. Heavenly Father, we're told to be in prayer for our leaders, and so we do pray for them, God, that you would uh, direct them as they lead our country. And Heavenly Father, whether or not we voted for him or President, uh, former President Trump, Lord, it doesn't matter now. And so, Lord, he is the man that is in the uh, White House at the current time. So, Lord, as he leads, we do pray that he would seek your direction, that he would operate under your discretion, and, Lord, that uh, ultimately, God, you would do a work in his heart and in his life that every decision that he makes would glorify you. Lord, we pray that also for us. Uh, God, here at Weiss Memorial Baptist Church and all those that are watching online, God, that ultimately here in this new year, that every decision that we'd make, God, would be according to the discretion uh, in, in accompanying uh, your will. God, we pray that every action that we would seek to do would be filtered by the Word of God. And Lord, we pray that 2021 not only would be a much better year than 2020, Heavenly Father, that it would be a year of remembrance for good things and not tragedy. And so this evening, God, we turn this uh, worship time over to you. We ask, God, that you would lead us in truth and by your spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let me go ahead, if I can, and make just a few announcements. You can go ahead and find in your Bibles Revelation chapter 2. I will recap very quickly from last week, and then we'll pick up where we left off. But we are looking at the church at Thyatira, all right? So with that said, we are going to have a change coming up. This coming Sunday, Lord willing, uh, we're going to be back in the church for Sunday school at 945, but it typically gets started about 10 a.m., and then 11 a.m. worship. We will not have 8.30 worship this week. We're going to look at the numbers, and, and we don't mind having 8.30. If the numbers uh, necessitate that, we will certainly go back to 8.30 as well. But at least for this coming Sunday, we're going to do 11 a.m. worship in Sunday school. And then instead of our uh, Sunday night worship being at the church at 6.30, we will continue at least momentarily for the next few weeks, to be online at 6 p.m. on those Sunday nights. All right, so just keep that in mind. Let me give you the quote of the week. Uh, it's by Thomas Brooks. He says, The more any man loves Christ, the more he delights to be with Christ alone. And so we pray that for you as well as ourselves this coming year as we are now into 2021 that we would love Christ more and a result of loving him more would be to desire to be with him more. Not only in heaven one day, and we look forward to that day, but to spend time alone with him in our weekly and daily quiet time here on this earth. Uh, also, uh, we have Kelly's, our former secretary, celebration scheduled for Sunday night following the PM worship on the 31st of this month. And we are not anticipating being back in the church on Sunday nights by that time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to postpone that celebration until after the PM worship resumes here at the church. So keep that in mind, and uh, we'll let you know. It won't be the first Sunday we'll back, but uh, we'll announce when it will be, all right? And then also, we do have Financial Peace University tomorrow night. If you're part of that crowd, we want to invite you to come. Uh, again, that'll be at 7 p.m. tomorrow night in the Fellowship Hall for Financial Peace University. And then also tomorrow night is um, Feed Ashboro, all right, the uh, Ashboro Shelter of Hope. Uh, you're going to drop off there. You're not going to be serving there, and that will be at 6 p.m. If you have 
uh, need of any information concerning that, you can contact our office and talk to Tammy, or you can contact Beth Pugh, all right? So with that said, I uh, look forward to seeing you this Sunday morning and um, see what God has in store for us as we're going to begin a new series. Uh, we've had uh, some precursor sermons to it, but this coming Sunday, we're going to begin looking seriously at a sermon series that I've entitled Envision 2021. What is it that you want to see in your life and what is it that you want to see in the life of the church uh, perhaps in 2021 that you've not seen in years previous? What is it that God would have you do in this year that you've not done in years past? Something new, something fresh. Or maybe it's simply uh, getting more serious about your quiet time and your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are anticipating a great year in 2021, not only in the life of the individual members of Weiss Memorial personally and individually, but also corporately. Uh, we pray that God would do a great work through our church and the other churches in our area in this upcoming year. With that said, go ahead and find again Revelation chapter 2. I pray you've already got your place. We're going to begin reading here in verse 18. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity, which in the King James will be translated love. So he says, I know thy works, I know your love and service and faith, and thy patience, or your endurance. And I know thy works, and the last to be more than the first. And then that dreaded word that we have looked at in previous churches, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space, I gave her time to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a literal sick bed, and them that commit adultery with her, that would speak to her followers, I'm going to cast them basically into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, this teaching from this woman, and which have not known the depths of Satan, that speaks to the deep teachings, literally of what she's teaching, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And so this evening, may the Lord add his blessings upon the reading of his word. If you were with us last week, I pray you were, uh, you noticed that we began looking at this church at Thyatira under the subtitle of the problem with a self-proclaimed prophetess. The problem with a self-proclaimed prophetess. You see that here in verse 20 where Jesus refers to her as this woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess. Jesus does not refer to her as a prophetess, nor does God, nor does literally John who's penning this letter. Uh, she proclaims herself to be that. And so we need to look out for people who are self-proclaimed uh, voices or speakers or representatives of God. And so as we open our Bible and as we read these verses, we saw some words that are very familiar. Uh, he says, I know your works. 
I know your love. I know your service. I know your faith. I know your endurance or your perseverance. And then he gave that word, notwithstanding, I have a few things against you. We here at White's and you in your churches would do well to follow this church in the areas that she's commended in. And then that's about it, though. Those areas that she is condemned in or corrected in, we would do well to avoid. You know, false teachers were prominent in John's day. They are even more uh, prominent in our day. You can't turn your television on on Sunday morning uh, without seeing a false prophet, a false teacher of the Word of God. And here is what makes their message so attractive. Number one, it appeals to the flesh. It is seemingly what I want to hear, how God's going to bless me. No matter the life I live, and besides, they don't talk about purity much. Uh, they talk about maybe performance, but they don't talk a lot about per, uh, purity. And they don't talk a lot about passion for the Lord Jesus Christ and a deep walk with Him. They talk about what God wants to do for you, not in your service for Him. And so you got to watch out for people like that. And we understand that, yes, while God wants to bless His children, He can only bless His children to the extent that their life allows Him to do that because He will not bless disobedience. Uh, he will not bless impurity. Uh, he will not uh, bless uh, that child of God that is walking uh, away from Him rather than close with Him. So you've got to watch out for the messages today. And it's always an uplifting message. There's no correction to it. There's no direction to it. There's no guidance. Uh, there's literally no depth to it. It's all superficial. Again, it's not what God wants you to do in this world as you live your life for Him. It's what God wants to do for you uh, in blessing your life and amassing this and getting that and enriching this. And, and I'm not saying God doesn't want to do that. I'm just saying God wants to do much more than that. And so with that thought, deception uh, goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden where Eve was deceived by the serpent. And if you're with us on Sunday nights, we're in the book of Genesis, and it's been a little while since we looked at that because we've made our way to Genesis chapter 6. Now, this coming Sunday night, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 7 where God shuts Noah up in the ark. Noah and his family are safely tucked away in the ark while the world literally drowns in a flood of judgment. And so that will be this coming Sunday night. I want to encourage you to tune in. Again, we'll be online for that at 6 p.m. But with that said, deception is as old as the history of this earth. And so as we look at this, not only was deception there in the Garden of Eden, but it's also in this church. And it is, um, if you would, promoted by this self-proclaimed providence. And so as we look at this, last week we began looking at the location of the assembly, the location of this church at Thyatira. And as you well remember, it is an odd fact that the uh, church located in one of the least important cities out of the seven receives the longest letter. And as we look at this, we noted that Thyatira was a commercial city. She was a commercial city. It meant that she was prosperous. Uh, Lydia, from the book of Acts, was a seller of purple. She lived in this city. Don't know if she necessarily attended this church here, but chances are that she may very well have. And so Lydia was a seller of purple there. And so this uh, city was known for its wool and dye industry. And I'm not going to go back into depth of that, but it was very prosperous. And many people believe that Lydia, uh, being in that profession herself, was very wealthy. And not only did we notice, though, that Thyatira was a prosperous city, Thyatira is also a perverted city, a perverted city. Uh, idolatrous worship was the order of the day there. And, you know, basically, as you look in this city, not only was the false uh, cults and teachings uh, permeating the city, but it had infiltrated the church. And that was the problem here. And, and listen very carefully, uh, even here at Weiss Memorial Baptist Church, you don't want to live in a city that is known for false teaching. You don't want to know, uh, you don't want to live in a city where the depths of Satan is known more than the love of God. But what is even more 
uh, tragic than that is when the teachings that have engulfed the area have infiltrated the church. And that's what happens here at this church at Fire Tower. They were allowing this woman who is a self-proclaimed prophetess to teach uh, God's word, which really was an altered God's word. She was not teaching the truths of God, but the depths of Satan, as we'll look at. And so we notice basically the location of the city. It was uh, very prosperous and it was very perverted. But secondly, we also looked at the characterization of authority, how Christ uh, depicts himself to them. Notice in verse 18. And unto the angel or messenger of the church and Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God. Now notice that designation. He proclaims himself as the Son of God. And then he gives a description of himself. Who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And so as we look at this, and you look at his characterization of authority, he begins by talking uh, in regards to himself as the sovereign God. The sovereign God. Here in Thyatira, he's not classifying himself or designating himself as the Son of Man, identifying with humanity, identifying as our sympathizer, our empathizer, who goes through difficulties just like we do, who can identify with our sufferings, uh, speaks to his humanity. He identifies himself as the Son of God, which speaks to deity. You see, this church didn't need comfort. They needed correction. They needed conviction. They didn't need this sympathetic high priest. They needed this sovereign and divine judge, which is depicted as the Son of God. And so we see him as the sovereign God. But also we noticed last week that he is the searching judge. He's the searching judge. He is our ultimate judge. Uh, he knows us better than anyone else. Now you might say, well, that's a comforting thought. And it can be, but it can also be a, a perplexing thought because he knows you better than anything else or anyone else does. In fact, the Lord Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves. And he knows our thoughts right now. Uh, he knows our intentions of what we're going to do. He knows why we did what we did when we did it. Now, if we did it out of a right motivation and a good heart, it was a good deed, then that's great. But you know what? If that is not true of whatever we did, then it's not so great. So as we look at him as the searching judge, he is one of perception. One of perception. Notice the Bible says, with eyes like a flame of fire. Literally, there is no blind, no facade that we can put up that the Lord Jesus with His penetrating eyesight as a flame of fire cannot see through. He burns through everything and sees the intentions of our heart. And here, as you look at this, He stands as the Son of God in stark contrast to the God, Son God, literally, Apollo, that was worshipped here in Thyatira. And so the eyesight or his eyes like unto a flame of fire. It speaks to a penetrating judgment. A piercing judgment. One that will allow him to see all. It's piercing. It's penetrating. It's purifying. And we need to know that. And I have always done this and... And I don't know necessarily that other Bible commentators uh, do this. Uh, I'm not trying to draw the correlation. But if you notice here, he has eyes like flame of fire that will allow him to judge through our works and to make manifest or evident not only what we did, but why we did it. And I've always correlated that with 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Hold your finger right there. Turn back with me, and you know, it is in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians, you just go to the left. If you get to Acts and Romans, you went too far. And I do want to ask you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. And here, Paul is addressing the church at Corinth. And, you know, there were some arguments going on uh, there in the assembly. There were some divisions going on. They were very carnal and in his first letter to the church, uh, there was 
divisiveness. Some were saying, well, you know what? I'm only a follower of Peter. Others were saying, well, you know what? My man's Apollos. Others were saying, well, you know what? I'm a follower of Paul. Others were saying, well, I follow Jesus. Well, you see that here in chapter 3. But then Paul tries to straighten that out. And then he says, you know what? Apollos or myself or Peter, we're only laborers with God. And then in verse 11 he says, for literally no other. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, and that is Jesus Christ. So notice again, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation. And you know yourself that a building is only as strong as its foundation. A belief system and you can liken that into a building because you're building your life on a belief system. It is only as good as the foundation. And there is no other foundation. There is no other belief system that will stand the test of judgment and time other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul says there's no other foundation for your life. There's no other foundation for the gospel. There's no other foundation for salvation. There's no other way to get to heaven except for Jesus. He is the foundation. And then, once you've laid that foundation, through your works, you begin to build on that. The apostles, the foundation was laid. That's Jesus. And then they preached the gospel, and they built upon that. Well, here, we are building upon that foundation. And then notice what he says in verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, that speaks of the eternal, that which we do that is eternal in our service for Him, in leading others to the Lord, when you lead someone to the Lord and they get saved, that cannot be taken away. That is eternal. But then notice, wood, hay, and stubble, that's temporary. You know, that might be items done uh, out of recognition for ourselves. It may have been a good work, but for the wrong motivation. And that's going to be likened unto wood, hay, and stubble, and it's temporary. Why is it temporary? Well, we'll see. Notice. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare. What day? I believe that day when he judges our works with a flame of fire. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now notice. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. That is that which is eternal that we spoke about. If any man's work shall be burned, that is the temporal, the wood, hay, and the stubble that we spoke about. He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yes, so as by fire. It's not that you won't get into heaven, it's that you won't get any rewards. Why? Because you did the temporal. You were not focused on the eternal. Uh, you lived your life and you served the Lord if you served the Lord. You did it for the wrong motivation or you did the wrong thing or whatever it is. When his eyes like a flame of fire, all right, burns through the facade and sees our works and our motivations, they're either going to stand the test of time and his judgment, which is piercing, which is penetrating, which is purifying. It's either going to stand that test and you're going to be rewarded or it's going to be burned up but you yourself will be saved. You'll be in heaven, but with no reward. Now, when you go back and you look into Revelation chapter 2, Jesus says, I know your works. I know your love. I know your labor. I know your endurance. And what he says to this church, he can say to you. He can say to me. And he can say to Weiss Memorial Baptist Church or whatever church you attend this evening, he can say the same thing. Well, as you look at this, it is one of perception. It's also one of perfection. He doesn't get it wrong. Uh, he doesn't need anyone giving approval for what he says because what he says is exactly truthful and there's no falsity that can accompany it. It's one of perfection. He sees perfectly and he judges perfectly. But then... Also, we notice the church's level of activity. Their level of activity. They were loving in their service. They were a loving church. And if you'll notice here, 
And something that I alluded to last week, notice in verse 19, I know your works and your love. What is said of them was it said of Ephesus, the first church in chapter 2 in verse 1. There he says you left your first love. Listen, they had their doctrine straight, but they had left their love. Here at Thyatira, they had their doctrine misconstrued, but they had their love right. So they were a loving church, but they were a church in trouble by way of doctrine and teaching. So they are exactly opposite of Ephesus. Ephesus didn't get love right, but they got doctrine right. Here, Thyatira gets love right, but they don't get doctrine right. You got to have both. You got to have the right love, and you also got to have the right teaching. And as you notice here, they were loving in their service, but also they were laboring for their Savior. Notice again in verse 19 I know thy works and thy love and service, and your service. Uh, they served the object of their love, and the object of their love was the Lord Jesus Christ. They loved him, and they served him. And so they were laboring. Uh, for their Savior. And when you look at this, we also need to understand that I don't believe you can separate love and labor. I believe they are closely and uniquely intertwined together in that the more we love Him, the more we serve Him. The more we love Him, the more we labor for Him. We don't labor to be loved. We love, therefore we labor. It's just like your spouse. Men, if you're married, or women, if you're married, uh, men, you serve your wife, not out of duty, but out of love. And the same thing for the wife. You don't do it. Uh, we pray you don't do it because the Bible commands mutual, okay, um, unification there and service, all right, and love. Uh, we don't hope that you do it out of command, but that you do it out of love. And when you look at this, one involves obedience. The other involves affection. And we pray that never grows cold. And so as we look at this, they were loving him. They were laboring for him. But then notice also in verse 19, they were loyal to him. They were loyal to him. And I know your faith. Your faith. Okay? They loved him. They served him. Faith is better translated fidelity or faithfulness. The genuine Christians of this church were trustworthy and consistent in their love for the Savior. But then, they were also long-suffering in their service. Notice again in verse 19, the Bible says, and the last to be more than the first. Literally, that's opposite of Ephesus. Ephesus left their first love. Here, the longer they loved Him, the longer they served Him, the deeper and stronger that grew. The last to be greater than the first. So they were progressing. But then, you have that word notwithstanding. And here's where we literally left off last week. We're going to finish up this week with, first of all, the list of accusations. He gives a list of accusations that are levied by the Lord. The list of accusations levied by the Lord. And you know what? At the top of the list, we see the tolerance of the church. The tolerance of the church. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants. You know, as we look at this, sin must never be swept under the rug and it must be dealt with swiftly. The longer you allow teaching that is not biblically based, the more apt that teaching is to be appealing to some who don't know the Bible, and it appeals to their flesh, and they think, well, you know what? It sounds good, therefore it must be good. It makes me feel good, therefore it must be good. And so the longer it goes on, the harder it will be to unroot it and get it out of that assembly. Even among all the labor, all the love, all the loyalty, and all the long suffering, there was a problem with tolerance. They were allowing, and listen very carefully, it wasn't that they didn't know she was teaching false doctrine. 
they knew it. They just didn't stop it. They didn't confront it. And as you look at this, the problem here, even though there was problems in the city, the problem for this church wasn't coming from the city. The problem from this church, or for this church, was coming from within the church. It wasn't that there was false teachings out there and the people needed to be careful where they went, and that was true though. The problem was the false teaching was on the inside and the people needed to confront what they were listening to. And they did not. So literally, tolerance could have been avoided had they adhered to the Word of God, but for whatever reason, they did not. Either, listen very carefully, either they lack courage or they lack conviction. Now, mark it down. Uh, I wasn't there. And so I don't know why they didn't confront this teaching, but let's say if they were the minority, they could have lacked courage. Because the majority had fallen in suit with this woman and the minority maybe was scared to confront it. And so they may have lacked courage. If they were a majority, chances are they could have lacked conviction. They could have lacked conviction. And therefore they didn't confront her. But either way, they lacked courage or conviction or possibly even both. And you know what? Even if they were a minority, if they would have had the conviction that they should have had based on the Word of God, whether they had the courage to do it or not, they would have done it. But nevertheless, they did not do it. And as we look at this, we see the tolerance of the church, but we also notice the teaching of the woman. The teaching of the woman. And this is the first area in which their toleration was evident. First of all, they abandoned the scriptural command that says a woman should not teach or preach within the church in usurping the authority of the man. The men are the leader of the home and they're to be leaders in the church. Paul wrote that in Timothy in, in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2 and verse 12. And, and so, you know, I don't want to get into all of that, but God has set up specific roles. Now, we have women teachers here, but they teach our children. Men hold the roles of teaching uh, other men and women. And so when you look at this, they compounded this by not only allowing her to teach when she shouldn't have been teaching, they allowed her to teach what she was teaching when she shouldn't have been teaching. So it wasn't just that they tolerated her to teach and allowed her to teach, but they tolerated her to teach while they allowed her to teach wrong things. And so they compounded the issue. Notice that phrase there. You allow is in the continual. It's active. You are allowing her. You're still allowing that woman Jezebel to teach. Now going back into the Old Testament, you remember probably the story of Elijah where he confronted the prophets of Baal there on Mount Carmel. Well, there was a wicked uh, Phoenician princess who married a wicked king named Ahab. Now this wicked uh, Phoenician woman or princess was Jezebel. And so it turns out that when she married King Ahab of Israel, who then led Israel into immorality and idolatrous worship of the Canaanite god, uh, Canaanite god Baal, uh, then she rose to obviously to prominence and she was very wicked. And when Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal, she swore that she was going to kill Elijah. And Elijah, when he got word of that, he ran away. And he hid himself under and he sat down under a tree wishing that he'd been dead because he felt so alone. And you can see that story in 1 Kings chapter 16. You can also see that story in 2 Kings in chapter 9. 1 Kings chapter 16, 2 Kings chapter 9. And so King Ahab was to his wife Jezebel. He tolerated her. <laughs> Listen, men. Uh, I don't want to even go down that road. But you know, I know some men who are married to some women and they just tolerate them. But then again, I know some women who are married to men and they just tolerate them. Uh, King Ahab was to his wife what Jezebel was to Thyatira and to her congregation. Whether they lacked conscience or whether they lacked courage. Whether King Ahab lacked conscience or whether he lacked courage. He did not 
confront his wicked wife. The old Jezebel, okay, of the Old Testament there with Elijah, she supported over 800 prophets of her immoral cult, and she killed as many prophets of God as she could and tried to kill Elijah. Now, in this chat, uh, in this church, and in this chapter, Jezebel is probably a descriptive title of her and not her real name. It's probably not that her name was Jezebel. Jezebel was her character. Jezebel was a description of her. Probably not her literal name. Some say it could have been Lydia, but I don't believe that. Lydia was a convert of the Apostle Paul, and she was converted by the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I don't believe it was Lydia. Others believe possibly that it was the wife of the pastor. Well, I don't believe that either. All right? So I don't believe that either. However, she was a literal woman who was clever in speech, obviously impressive in personality, who professed to know God, who could interpret His will, and she, she claimed to have a direct communication with God. She's a prophetess. She says, I'm representing God. Me and Him, we have a two-way line of communication. I talk to him, and he tells me what to say to you. And so she's this self-proclaimed prophetess. Her teachings took on two forms. Notice here. First of all, notice that phrase there, to seduce my servants to commit fornication. To seduce, that is to lead into false teaching. To lead into false teaching my servants to commit fornication which during this time was a symbol of idolatry. A symbol of idolatry. The child of God today, who is aligned with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is saved and converted by Him, you say, well, we don't commit fornication today. We're not cheating on our spouses or whatever. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about spiritual fornication. We are the bride of Christ. We are a spouse to Him. And when we set up other idols of worship, when we uh, place things, people, whatever, possessions, ahead of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are committing spiritual fornication. Just like right here. But then secondly, to eat things sacrificed to idols, which is a symbol of this church united with the world. United with the world. Now, we here at White's, we are to be in the world, saturating it with the gospel, but not allowing the world to penetrate us with its teachings and its mentality. And sadly though, sadly, I believe the world in many ways is doing a much better job in infiltrating the church like right here then the church is infiltrating the world with the gospel. And that's to our demise. Well, when you look at this here, she was certainly the leader. You say, well, how do you know she was the leader? Because she had followers. If you got followers, you're the leader. If you're a self-proclaimed leader and you don't have followers, then you're not the leader. And so she obviously had followers. And the Bible teaches that obviously the true, genuine child of God can fall into sexual immorality, even idolatry. These did. Now this is bad. But to leave, lead others into it like Jezebel here is doing deserves the strictest punishment by God. And so, listen very carefully. Elijah's Jezebel in the Old Testament was so wicked that Elijah prophesied that she would not only die, but that her body would be eaten by dogs. And that happened. The prophecy came true. Notice what the Lord says in regards to this Jezebel. And we're going to notice that not only as under the tolerance of the church, the teaching of this woman, but also the testimony of the Lord. The testimony of the Lord. Notice in verse 22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. I will cast her into a sick bed. 
So first of all, here in verse 21, we see that God's discipline is fair. His discipline is fair. Jesus gave her time to repent. Notice again in verse 21, and I gave her space. I gave her time to repent of her fornication and she repented not. He gave her time. He gave her space. But she obviously loved the fruitful works of darkness more than the light and her refusal to repent was met with an abrupt word, Behold. Notice in verse 22. Behold, I will cast. So God always gives ample time for repentance, but the time comes when God's judgment is not only fair, but it also becomes full. So God's judgment is fair. He will reward to the righteous. He will reward to the wicked. But it's also full. She made her bed, literally, and now she can lie in it. Literally, it's a sick bed. It's a bed of sickness or pain that denotes suffering, severe and debilitating punishment. You can correlate that with 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, 27 through 30, where many partook of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, and some of them even died because of that. Others were cast into a sick bed. But notice here, the phrase commit adultery, uh, literally a, a marital fidelity because we are the bride of Christ and we're to be married to Him alone. And notice, repent of her deeds, repent of her fornication, which she repented not. Her time for repentance is past. Her follower situation is not as dire. Notice in verse 23. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am He which searches the reins and the hearts. And I will give every one unto every one according to their works. Notice again in verse 22. Behold, I will cast her into a sick bed. And them, her followers, who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So they still have time. Her time is past. They still got time. But if they don't repent, then literally, what Jesus is saying is, they may taste physical death. God may kill them. And so his discipline is full, but now notice, it's final. It's irreversible. If they do not repent, I will kill her children to death. It's literally a Hebraism of intensity. Her children are not literally her biological offspring. They represent her spiritual followers. And so God will remove those who are beyond repentance and restoration. If they're unwilling to repent and to be restored, then God's going to remove them. When you look at that, we know that according to the epistles of John, there is a sin unto death that the child of God can commit. And so his discipline is fair. It is final. And so we notice the testimony of the Lord. But now notice the truthfulness of the Lord in verse 23. I will kill her children with death and all the churches, all the churches, then and now, we here at White's, and all the churches will know that I am He which searches the reins and the hearts. And so I am the one who searches the minds, literally the kidneys and the hearts of the people. He will give to every person according to their works. His judgment is final. It is fair. It is full. And His truthfulness declares that what He says will happen. And then lastly, we see an uplifting appeal by the Savior. Notice in verse 24, But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, and as many as not received this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, that is her teaching, as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden. First of all, he says, you know what? You need to live for the Savior. They need to live for the Savior. And in verse 24, you see that. Listen, as many as have not received their words or her words, they should live for the Savior. But then notice, 
and which have not received or known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden. Not only should they continue to live for the Savior, they should continue to live separated lives. Listen, don't allow the city to contaminate you. Don't allow the teachings of this woman to persuade you. You need to confront her. Listen, her time of repentance is past. You need to hold fast to what you have. And so they need to continue to live separated lives, but they also needed to live steadfast lives. Hold fast to what you have. Don't let what you have slip. Don't digress. The exhortation is to hold fast, which means to reject that which is evil. And so they were to live separated, and they were to be steadfast. And so they were to live for the Savior. But then notice also in verse 25, but that which you have already, notice that phrase, hold fast till I come. They should not only live for the Savior, they should look for the Savior. They should look for the Savior. Hold fast till I come. And then in verse 25 through 27, he describes that. And so as you look at that, he says, when I come, you will enjoy a glorious reign. A glorious reign. Notice in verse 26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my Father. To keep Christ's works is continuous, and it means to keep His word. It means to live in His will. And to do so until the end is to hold fast to what we have. Vance Habner once said this, faith that fizzles before the finish was faulty from the first. Faith that fizzles was faulty from the first. That is, if you've got genuine faith, persevere. And your perseverance makes evident a genuine conversion. And whenever the Lord Jesus Christ returns to this earth with us, that's after the rapture, we are going to enjoy a glorious reign with Him in the millennial reign of Christ. We see that when He rules with a rod of iron. But then notice lastly, we enjoy a wonderful revealing. A wonderful revealing. Not only do we enjoy a glorious reign with Him, but we're going to see Him in a different light. Notice there in verse 28, And I will give unto Him the morning star. What is the morning star? What is this morning star? Uh, is it Lucifer in Isaiah 14, 12? No. Is it immortality in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3? No. It's the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. It's Jesus. Revelation 22, 16. He is the morning star. And so basically... When the end comes, in verse 26, we get Jesus. If you follow the depths of Satan, you get a fallen star. If you follow the teachings of the Lord Jesus, you get the morning star. And then, he winds all of this up by saying, you should listen to the Spirit. Notice in verse 29, He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The charge is to the church to listen. Tune their ear, follow by action to what the Spirit says to the church. And the same thing here at White's Memorial. We are to listen to the Spirit of God through His Word and that we are to do what the Spirit of God says do. That is our goal in 2021. And as we wind this up, I want you to remember this. To Ephesus, you left your first love. To Smyrna, you're faithful and persecuted but be faithful to the end. To Pergamum, repent of your practical compromise or else I will come quickly. And here to Thyatira, to the false he says, repent. But to the faithful, he says, remain. And for those of you who remain, you get me. When I was pastor, right after, right after seminary, literally, of North Graham Baptist Church had a dear saint of God there named Beerer, Beerer Satterfield. She's home with the Lord now. 
And she used to pray for me. And this is what she prayed. She said, you know, I pray for you every day. And I pray that God would keep you close to Him and that He would keep you clean. He would keep you close and that He would keep you clean. And can I tell you today, if you're listening, there's no greater prayer for you to pray for your pastor. That God would keep him close and that God would keep him clean. But can I also tell you there's no greater prayer for you to pray than that for yourself. Every morning, just say, God, this is a new day. I pray that you keep me close to you. And I pray that you keep me clean in a contaminated world. Well, I pray God gives you a great week. And listen very carefully. Wise Memorial, we look forward to seeing you in Sunday school this coming Sunday around 945. We'll begin good at 10 a.m. And then in 11 o'clock, worship. And again, if numbers dictate, we have no problem going back to two services. But we just want to see who's going to be coming uh, to begin with. And then our evening worship, instead of 6.30 here, it's going to be 6 p.m. online. Sunday night, and then next Wednesday, uh, we're back in church. Regular service, regular schedule, all kids' activities, Awanas and youth begin at 6.30. Uh, preaching and Bible study and prayer time will begin at 7 p.m. in here in the sanctuary. Uh, but until then, I pray God gives you a great week. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we know that there is a time in our life when we need to repent. And there's also a time in our life when we need to remain. And I God, now I pray that your spirit would make evident in our life which one needs to take place today. If there's sin in our life, God, may we repent. And God, if we are close and if we're clean, may we remain until the coming of our Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.